As we say in South Texas, where we're from, out of shoot number four comes New Life Ministries. <laughs> I think y'all are ready for the word. So why don't you turn with me to the book of Judges. And when you find Judges, I want to hear Gideon. Because we're going to talk about small beginnings. Small beginnings. Pretty good, ain't it? I like that. How many of you know that the One Association didn't start out huge? It did not start out huge. It had a small beginning. It started as a vision that took a while to come into fruition. And when it came into fruition, it started in a garage <laughs> with just a couple of people. It had small beginnings. Look at it now, church. Look at it now. New Life Ministries is no different. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Small beginnings. If you're in Judges chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 11. Hallelujah. Then the angel of the, of the Lord came and sat under the oak. That was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. Gideon was a son to a man named Joash. Whether you realize it or not today, sitting here, you are a son or a daughter to someone or something. You just need to make up your mind and be determined who you're a son or a daughter of. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and he said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first time in the book that Gideon was mentioned. Is that right? He calls him a valiant warrior. Well, who, who did he beat up? Who did he fight? How did he become a valiant warrior? Isn't it amazing that God will see you in a different way than you see yourself? Yeah. He called this guy a warrior and he ain't never had a fight yet. You see, we always sell ourselves too short from what God has already in, it has in store for you. And we don't see that because we sell ourselves too short. You have to realize that God sees you a whole lot different than you see yourself. You just need to get on board with it. Then Gideon said to him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. I like what Gideon said here. He said, Hey, I know what my fathers passed down to me. And you know what? At New Life Ministries, we absolutely know what's been passed down to us because we have some amazing men of God over us. Pastor Wade and Pastor Matt and, and Pastor Eric have labored long and hard passing things down to us. You guys receive the same things. You get material. You get uh, words of prophecies, things that are passed down to you. Not only that, but we have this precious gospel that's been passed down to us. And we have a responsibility to not just to hold on to it. Man, that's so good. I'm glad you're sharing that with me. But I know that I have a responsibility to pass it down to somebody else. Amen. Just like all of you do. We're not shunning that responsibility. We are, we are diving into it headlong. We are passing down what our forefathers have passed to us. Amen. And the Lord looked at him and he said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he said to him, Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my clan is the least in all of the clans, and I'm the youngest in my father's house. You know, we stand here before you today, four of us. Me and three guys. I think Pastor Wade was sharing something about it. I got three friends. Well, I got three guys with me. And you know what? We absolutely know in Victoria that we are the smallest of the churches in the one association. We are the, I'm not going to say we're the weakest, but we are the smallest. And you know what? 
We are absolutely secure in that fact because we know exactly who we are and where we are. And let me tell you something. If you don't know who you are in Christ, if you're not secure in that, you'll never be able to accomplish the DCD. Uh, there you go. That's the word I was looking for. You'll never become a disciple if you don't know who you are and if you're secure in the fact that you are a son or a daughter of the Most High God. You'll, you'll get ate up and spit out real quick. We are absolutely secure in who we are and what we're doing. The Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Earlier this year in New Life Ministries, actually after we came back from Chicago last year, the Rising Church, we, uh, we started praying for New Life that we could get another building. We wanted to, we wanted to branch out. We wanted to um, be more focused in the community. So we started praying about a building last October. We told God, look, this is our budget. This is what we have to work with. Can you find something? Can you help us? And would you make it absolutely clear to us where we're supposed to be? So we called people. We, we went and looked at places. We always ended up at one little particular spot. So we started claiming it. You know, everywhere you put your foot, you claim it for the Lord. We started doing that. We did that all the way up until December. And so... We got to the point where, you know, we felt like this is where God wanted us to be. So we called the, the people that own the property and we said, okay, what's the next step for us? What do we do? They said, well, you got to get the city manager, all the officials to come inspect your building, to see if you can put a church in there, um, to see if it'll hold however many people you want to put in there. This place has been closed down for years. No electricity on, nothing. But we met anyways in the dark with all the city officials. The fire marshal tells us, you know, I think you can put 100 people in there. I'm like, hold on a second. I don't want 100 people. <laughs> Man, are you kidding me? 100 people right now? We're, we're, we're three strong, not, not 100. That's too many. Just kind of like the Lord told Gideon, you got too many people. So the fire marshal says, no, I think your occupancy is good at 100. He says, however, in that wall right over there, we're going to need an extra door. We're talking about a brick concrete building and i'm thinking how, how am i going to get these people to agree to cut a door in the wall so that was friday i called them immediately after the fire marshal inspected that building and i called the city and i said hey um this is what the fire marshal said this is exactly the words that they told me um we're sorry but we're not going to cut a wall to put a door in there for you guys so that's it we didn't get disappointed. We took it to the Lord in prayer on Sunday. Amen. We prayed Sunday. We said, God, we just feel like we claim this place for the kingdom. You kept leading us back here. We just trust that it's you. Would you show us a sign? Would you give us a way to know that we're doing what you would have us to do? We prayed real simply Sunday night. Monday morning, my phone rang. The lady says, um... Pastor Treister, I don't know how to explain this to you, but we're going to put another door in that wall that the fire marshal wanted. Yeah. We literally, we literally know that that's where we're supposed to be, and we're, we're, we're good with that. We're absolutely uh, on board with what God's doing in Victoria with our little group and our little building. And, yes, it used to be an old liquor store. You know, it, Kind of amazing. I get to tell people everywhere that I meet that, you know, the God that I serve has a sense of humor because he took two former alcoholics, got them radically changed, filled them with the Holy Spirit, and he put them in a liquor store so he can pass out new wine. Wow. That's pretty crazy. So we asked for a sign like Gideon did, and we understand exactly that that's where we're supposed to be, and we're, we're full of joy about it. I want to turn now to uh, Proverbs, Amen. chapter 22.
Proverbs 22, verse number 6. All beginnings. Proverbs 22, 6. It says this. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. When we were studying for our session here at the One Association meeting, and the Lord put this scripture on our hearts, we're like, mm, well, how we, what are we going to do with that one, Lord? So I've had some time, you know, to, to think about it and ponder about it. Because let me just tell you something. I realized... Uh, sitting back here these last couple of days that I'm actually the oldest pastor of all the churches. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, is there any of the pastors of all the other churches that's older than 52? Yeah, I didn't think so. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this passage and I'm thinking, Lord, this is a scripture that we use for like when we're teaching our children. All of my children are grown up and gone. They left home already. They're serving God. Amen. They're, uh, they're blazing a trail. But they're gone. I'm like, Lord, you gave me Proverbs 22, 6. And then I realized because he began to speak to me, and he said, you know, if you're really a shepherd after my own heart and you really care about people, then your job of training up children is never over. Amen. It's never done. Amen. It's never finished. And you know what? I don't think that this scripture is talking about physical children only. I think it's talking about spiritual children. Amen. That you're supposed to be raising up spiritual children. I'm, I'm pretty much done with all of my natural children. But you know what? I'm not done. Amen. God is not finished just because I turned 52. I still got something that God wants me to do. And you know what that is? Train up children. Spiritual children. And let me just tell you something about these men standing behind me. I don't view them as disciples. I view them as spiritual sons. Amen. I view them as sons. And that's exactly how I want, it, I want them to feel as they're being trained up. Is that I view them as sons because God gave them to me in the ministry. They're sons in the faith. And you know what? I think all of us have the opportunity to sow into somebody else's life and be a father or a mother to them in the faith. And that's exactly what the gospel is all about, isn't it? So we're training, we're teaching, we're discipling. See, I think that word train covers all of that. Teach, train, disciple, cry with them, laugh with them, be, be full of discernment over them, call out things, discipline. All of those things. That's part of the teaching and discipleship process. So that's why I believe that God gave me Proverbs 22, 6 is because I know that not just these guys behind me, but there's going to be many more because I'm not going to quit. At 52, I think I'm just getting started, really. I started a little bit later than, than most, but you know what? There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of children out there that, uh, that God has appointed for me. And I realize that. And I'm gonna I'm looking for them. Amen. And I'm and we're gonna we're gonna do the same thing with them. We're gonna teach them, we're gonna disciple them, we're gonna train them. Uh, that's how we've all got here, right? Yeah. Somebody took the time to train us up in the way that we're supposed to go. And when we're old like me, we don't depart from it. We just keep pressing on a little bit further, and we keep doing a little bit more. Because you know what? I got a I got a father that's older than me, and he's still preaching. He set an example for me, and I'm going to follow his example, and then I'm passing it down. I've got children that's going to pass me up. Matter of fact, one of them already did. I can't keep up with Justin anymore. He's way ahead of me already. Hallelujah. That's a great, that's a great thing. That is a great thing, to have your children pass you up. It's amazing. But you know what's even greater than that? Now that they're passing me up, i got five grandsons. Then now I can get to start over, really, and train up children in the way they should go. Those are natural, but we're going to focus on the spiritual children. Amen. Can you agree, Diva? I better make it quick. Don't go to sleep when you. <laughs> You're going to be all right, Clay. <laughs> Take your time. Hey, 
y'all doing today? Well, I got to start off with a little bit of my testimony. And uh, talking about the discipleship. Talking about that discipleship. A lot of it deals in my life with discipline. That's what I got to say right there. And uh, that's right. And uh, the discipline is set forth with Eric. He's the one who's been there for me from the beginning. I came from a big church in Victoria that there was nobody there to, to do that for me. And to have him, it's it's a huge blessing in my life. And as, as I've been walking my walk with the Lord, he's allowed me to get married and have a beautiful daughter. Yeah. Yeah. I want to turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Got to find it, though. Hang on. Yeah. Everybody there? I heard Gideon, but I didn't hear it enough times. That's right. All right. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Spirit of adoption, as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, discipline. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Well, my mind just went blank. I'm nervous as heck right now. Yeah. My pastor warned me about that and it hit me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna pass the mic to Mr. Uh, Eddie here. Let's see what he's got to say. Let me let me let me shoot. <laughs> Hey, where's, uh, where's Pastor Hutchinson? It, it's interesting that, that uh, Pastor Hutchinson mentioned something about we're in Houston and you can have your best life now. What Clay forgot to tell you was in Victoria, Texas, we have the best life now, Act 2, because we have one of their branches in Victoria, and he sat in that place for two years, and nobody asked him, hey, how are you doing? Hey, what are you struggling with? Is there something that I can pray with you about? And, you know, see, that's what we're, we're up against in Victoria, and that's why we're saying we're, we're starting off small. But we know that this is just a matter of time because of what's going on in places like that, that young men like this are sitting there and wasting away and, and losing their life. We know that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be pulling out of that place and saving more guys like Clay because Amen. I was only with him for like 20 minutes, and he was bawling his eyes out confessing all kinds of sin. And then he got born again in my living room. So, yeah. He forgot to tell you that part. All right. All right. I'm going to start off with a little bit of my background. I spent 12 years in Catholic school. And let's just say I've learned more in the last three years that I've been with this organization than I've learned my whole life. They would teach scripture, but they wouldn't teach you to dig into it. 
all they wanted to do was, okay, this is my definition. This is what I say it says. Not what the Holy Spirit tells them. And that was something that I am glad that Pastor Cherister took the time. Because when I first met him, he got maybe two words out of me. (laughs) And the more I've learned and the more I've studied under him, under his guidance, it taught me to ask the Holy Spirit for the scriptures. For the meaning, not, and not to look for the man-made doctrine of the different religions that are out there. And talking about growing up sons that are greater than you are. Not only in the spiritual, but to me, it hits my heart because I have two sons of my own and one of them is a little bit older and when he was born I was not living right I did not know God I thought I knew Jesus but I came to the realization I never had a true relationship with him and now I feel that I'm getting a stronger relationship with Jesus I feel that I can call on the Holy Spirit and guide me through there is one scripture I would like to share John 5 19 I think everybody's there. I'm finally there. All right. Jesus therefore answered and was saying to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing and the greater works that these will he show him that you may marvel for just as the father raised the dead and gives them life even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes And that basically, if we do not teach our biological children, our spiritual children, how will they know? How how can we expect them to live up to the standard if we are not willing to put forward that standard? And I would like to leave you all with that. It's a good word. Hey, I forgot to mention something while I was talking about. Give me the mic. These guys being, these guys being spiritual sons. Actually, I can call this one Miho. Because he's my son in law. Amen. So I stand here with my pastor behind me, who is also my father in law. And uh, I want to talk about love today because I was sitting there with his grandson, my oldest one. And my wife, and I was thinking, and I was just like, man, I really love this boy. And I named him Noah. 
That's what I felt God led me to name him. And I was looking at him, and I was just, I was overwhelmed. That I just started crying. And my wife looked at me, and she goes, why are you crying? And, <laughs> and it's not that I realized that I loved him that much, but I realized that's how much my father loved me. That's how much my pastor loved me. That's how much I'm supposed to love everybody. So I look at this love and I see how it's, it's what causes discipleship. You know, I can look around the room and I see guys that are just leaders in discipleship. I see Pastor Eric Stevens, man, I look in his eyes and I just see a fire. And what's, what's fueling that fire is the love, the love to please his heavenly father. I look at Zeke over here in the middle. I love Zeke. I met him in Mexico, and, man, I've, I've loved him ever since. You know, it's been probably 10 years now. You know, I see that same fire in his eyes, and I know it's fueled by that love to serve God. And this, I felt like I, you know, I understood what God's love was, and I really thought I did until I had my own children. And then seeing that and understanding that, man, that's a whole other level. For those of you that don't know, I have a pretty tough job, which requires me to put myself in harm's way for people just, just because that's my job and that's what I love doing. That's where God led me to go. But for the same, I have to do the same for my spiritual family. So I'm going to read in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. So I look around and I know, I know my pastor will lay down his life for me because he's already doing that. I see Pastor Eric Stevens, he's already lived that example. Every, every mission trip he's gone on, just seeing him get in the situations he's in that could cause physical death. But we know what, you know, God has his place for him in heaven waiting. So what I, what I realize is that I have to have that love to create disciples as well. And seeing my children physically, I, I know that I need to have that spiritually. And having these great examples like Pastor Treaster, Pastor Stevens, Zeke, and all you guys that I saw speaking this last couple of days, man, it's just, and it gives me hope that there are men out there that are, vigilantly going after what this is and forcefully going to these dark places and moving their whole families you look at the brant in indonesia it's like wow you know to just uproot yourself and plant yourself in a place like that knowing that god's calling you to do that and that he's gonna just do miracles and just the love that you have to please him to do that's just amazing to me so I just wanted to share that love is the, is the fuel that is causing us to make these disciples. And we see it all through here. And we just need to get a hold of that and just continue growing with that love and sharing that love. Amen. 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 You know, it's interesting, uh, I think last year, um, the way the order was, I went before Pastor Hutchinson, and he shared that I stepped on some of his scriptures. Well, they reversed the order this year, brother, because you got some of mine. Because <laughs> I'm going to read Math, uh, Malachi chapter 4 again. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Submission Ministries talked about a mantle. I want to tell you today that a mantle 
has been fallen from heaven. It's given to the one association to do exactly what that says right there. Because the one association is like no other organization that'll take people in off the streets that they don't even know, will bring them into their house and treat them like their own children. I've seen, I've seen the Vincents. We've got to use them that... We got to use them again. I'm sorry, guys. I'm not picking on you, but I'm, I'm never going to forget Brent and Teresa. I don't know how many years ago it was, but they went to downtown Houston doing homeless ministry, and they found a young man named Kevin sleeping up underneath the, the overpass, and they took him home with him, and he lived with them. That's exactly what this scripture is talking about. And see, that's the mantle that God has placed upon the one association. We're going to continue to always look for the down and outers, for those that feel like they don't have a family, for those that feel like they don't have a mother or father. And we're going to reach out to them, and we'll take them in gladly. I had to share that story because where we're placed at in Victoria, we are, we are dealing with homeless people quite a bit. And I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it. You know that we, could, we got an apartment complex behind us that's a Section 8. Uh, you don't have to knock on any doors because they're so poor. Their air conditioners don't work, so they're always sitting outside. So you can just walk right in there and just start preaching. And uh, it, it's really amazing. Funny thing is, I asked them, hey, has the Jehovah Witnesses been over here? Because they're right next to us. we got a Jehovah's Witness Hall, right? I mean, literally across the street, right? Yeah, it's literally across the street. But guess what? I found a place where they won't go. They won't go to that apartment complex. The first time I took Brother Nolan over there, uh, y'all don't know this, but Nolan's been, been uh, pumping us up in Victoria. He's, he comes down and he leads worship every other Sunday. Yeah, we feel like Nolan's a part of us. We just, uh, we love his family. They're so amazing. But the first time I took Nolan over there, it was like noon, and we break up a drug deal in the middle of the afternoon because we wanted to talk about Jesus. We wanted to find the people that, they don't feel like they have a family. They don't feel like they have a, a father or somebody over them. There's so many of them. There's so many of them. I met an 11-year-old boy over there two weeks ago. Broke my heart. Um, no, no father. Four, four siblings. Um, he's the oldest. Running around crazy at 8 o'clock. It was like 8 o'clock at night, wasn't it? Yeah, 8 o'clock at night, running around crazy. Cusses his mom out continuously. Cusses out all of his neighbors. Been kicked out of school like I don't know how many times. The mother asked me if I would pray for him, and I said I'd be absolutely overjoyed to be able to pray with that little boy. She couldn't get him to come over there and sit down. He didn't want nothing to do with that. I mean, just gripped by the world right now at 11 years old, street smart. I told these guys if we don't get a hold of him by the time he's 16, he'll be in jail. She finally coaxed him just to sit down for a few seconds, and I got just enough time to put my arm around that little boy and say, and whisper in his ear and tell him, hey, in the name of Jesus, you don't have to act like this. You can be free. Jesus loves you, and he doesn't want you to be this way. He didn't acknowledge any of that. He didn't look at me. But you know what? I'm I'm convinced that he heard it. And that's a start. So we're looking. We are actively looking for people like that. They need a father figure. Let me ask some of you fathers here today. If you don't have any children, are you looking for some children that you can be a father figure to? If your children are grown and gone, what are you doing? Are you thinking, oh, it's time for retirement now? Let me tell you something. In the kingdom, there is no retirement. You get refired. You get a fresh fire, and you start over, and you do some more. You don't retire. There is no retirement. I'm convinced of that. I mean... We got some elders here in the front row that they're setting a pretty good example. They ain't quitting. They ain't backing up. They're going to keep going. They're going to blaze a trail. And that's exactly what, what we're going to do. And I know that's the stage of, of, of where I'm at because my children are gone. I'm going to look for some more children to raise up. Amen. Even if they're not natural, we'll raise up some spiritual children. I see that as the mantle that's on this organization because that's what God has called us to do, to make sons and daughters in the kingdom turn with me to first corinthians chapter two i think michael shared this one too (laughs) i think he got this one this is cool 
1 Corinthians chapter 2. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to, to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't know if y'all realize this. I've, I've recently been kind of pondering this. But I think we are fortunate in the one association that we have a spiritual father over us. That his desire is to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And not only is that his his goal when he's among us, because he's, he's been that way, just not in our church, but all the churches. But truthfully, and this may not have ever been said, and he can, you can correct me for it later, Pastor Stevens. But truthfully, I want you to think about something. We literally have someone walking out before us, the office of a, an apostle. Why? Because he goes and he strengthens in the churches. He sets an example that all of us are to follow. And I don't know about you, but I'll do anything I can to follow in his footsteps. And see, that's exactly what he wants us to do. He wants us to follow exactly in his footsteps. Isn't that the DCD concept? Yeah. That we follow in our rabbi's footsteps? Yeah. That's exactly what he, that's all he wants to do. And I would say it's working, wouldn't you? Yeah. I would say it's working. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm proud to stand here and say, I love my spiritual father. I mean, because the example he set is like, wow, man, I got I to gotta run a little faster and stay up behind him a little bit because that is incredible. Where, where do you learn how to teach all that stuff like that? You know, it's like amazing. You know, we are fortunate. There's no other organization like that. I promise you. I dare you to find one. I'm going to give you a whole year. When we come back next year, tell me if you can find somebody that's full, fulfilling the, the office of an apostle like uh Pastor Stevens. I'll save you the time, though. You won't find one. He, he's, he's blazing a trail, and there's a lot of people following him, and that is so amazing. And that's what we're all supposed to be doing. You know, I, I heard it said that... Amen! Yeah! 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 Yeah, yeah, because Rajah's blazing a trail right across the middle of India. And now I think he's going to go north and south. Yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. I heard it once said that uh, if you really want to know if you're a leader, if you're leading people, look behind you, see if there's anybody following you. Pastor Eric don't even have to look behind no more because he knows that they're, they're there. He could probably feel some of them breathing down his neck, <laughs> trying to overtake him. And you know what? I'm sure he'd be perfectly okay with that. All right. I'm going to finish with Hebrews. Let's turn to Hebrews because now I'm going to challenge everybody in the room. Yes. Thank you. Hebrews chapter 12. Yes. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, look around you. Yeah, okay. There's not just a great cloud of witnesses here. There's a many people out there on that screen that's witnessing this. But we have a whole heavenly host that's witnessing what we're doing. And I'm pretty sure they're up there cheering on the one association. We have a great cloud of witnesses. So then, we should... Lay aside every encumbrance, everything that connects us to the world, everything that trips you up. You need to get rid of it. It says right here that you need to lay aside everything that trips you up. That's the DCD concept. You can't hold on to nothing. Jesus said it this way. If you're not willing to forsake all, you cannot be my disciple. Cannot says to lay aside everything and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The race that is set before us is one race and that's discipleship. That we get discipled and we make disciples. That's the race. 
You know, I think I have a, a, an appendix to the Talmudim, and I read a, uh, a little, I'm going to read a little bit from it too, except for I'm going to quote it. It says in there that there's only two kinds of people. Those who are lost, and they need to be evangelized. Whose job is that? That's our job, right? And the other kind of person is somebody that's got saved, and they need to be discipled. That's the only two kinds of people there are. Lost or being discipled. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Verse 2. This is how we're going to do this. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Everybody say, I'm going to look to Jesus. You know, we have a beautiful example in our association. An amazing man of God. <laughs> but you know what? We can look to the sun. Yes. Yes. We can look to the real sun yes. and make that our example. Because didn't Jesus say, hey, you'll do greater things than I did. That's, that's really our ultimate example. And that's what Pastor Eric is leading us in doing is to follow Jesus. Follow his example. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the one that started this thing in you. And he's going to be the one that finishes it in you. It's him. It's nothing else. It's Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He despised the shame of it, and he sat down at the right hand of God. You might have to endure something in your life. But let me tell you something. If it's not worth fighting for, then why don't you just get out of it? Yeah. If it ain't worth fighting for, are you willing to fight for this? Yeah. Are you willing to fight for your brothers? Yeah. Are you willing to fight for the kingdom? Yeah. Then fix your eyes on Jesus. That's the answer. Fix your eyes on him. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. See, he set a perfect example for us. Man, I don't know how many of you have followed Pastor Eric around, but I'm going to tell you what, it's hard to keep up with him. There's a lot of men that are blazing a trail. We can't get weary and give up, though, because we, we get the idea in our mind, well, I can't do what they're doing. I can't keep up with them. Maybe God's just calling you to be uh, sure of who you are in Christ. Amen. And be okay with starting out with small beginnings. He's not asking you as soon as you get born again to save a nation. You've got to get discipled first before you can do that. Amen. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I don't know of anybody in here that's shed any blood over the gospel yet. Notice I said yet. Because we might get that opportunity. Amen. We just yeah. might. We might get that opportunity. We had a lot of crazy things happen to us. We had guns put in our faces. We get sick every time we go overseas. We get stranded in foreign countries. We get stuck in the mud in Mexico. We had a lot of things happen to us. But you know what? We've not yet resisted to the point of shedding our blood. Since we haven't shed any blood, then I guess we can still keep going. We still got a lot of work to do. You have not yet shed any blood in your striving against sin. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Some of you are like, well, wait a minute. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a man. I'm a woman. Well, guess what? This addresses you too. Sons and daughters. Because Clay read that scripture a while ago. If you are led by the Spirit of God, he gives you the right to be called the sons and the daughters. See, he had a daughter not too long ago, and he, he couldn't help but ask me one time, uh, you know, we're always talking about sons in the kingdom, uh, but I got a daughter. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> where, where does that fit in? I said, well, didn't it say in Acts chapter 2 that your sons and your daughters will prophesy? Yeah? Yeah, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And I had to share with him a while ago, too. In case you hadn't forgot, most of the ladies are better singers than the men. So, you know, we got to have some worship leaders. Maybe maybe he gave, gave you a daughter to be a worship leader. But she has a part to play in the kingdom. She is a child of the Most High God, and we're supposed to raise him at that. You have forgot the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons and daughters. My son, 
Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. See, DCD concept is we're okay with discipline. Matter of fact, it's in our one association oaths. We are not afraid to ask for correction. We are not afraid to ask for discipline when we need it. Listen, the one association started as a small beginning, new life. Right now we're small, but we're in the beginning. But we're going we're gonna to be like Gideon in the end because Gideon's name means warrior. Maybe that's what the angel of the Lord was saying to him. We've already fought a few battles of our own. We've already been around the world a few times. And you know what? We're just getting started. We are just getting started. We are excited about where God has placed us because in Victoria we're surrounded by some pretty crazy mega churches that are crumbling from the inside out. Imagine that. Yeah, if you're not about producing disciples, what are you producing? You're producing things that are not going to last. We're, we're making things that are going to last in the one association. Amen? Well, that's the most uncomfortable I've been in a long time. <laughs> hey, why don't we, uh, yeah, let's look at Philemon, or if you like, Philemon. First chapter, sixth verse. Yeah, that's the 2011 comic book version of the NIV. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a complete understanding of what is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, I realize that says something close, and I wish it were right. Uh, perhaps in the ESV, it, it's better. I, I don't know. It all, always, always better. Something special happens to you when you are active in sharing your faith. Now, here, here's something that we're, we're going to close right here, but here's something that I, I just want to touch on for a minute. So you're, you're not unaccustomed to hearing that. Oh, yes, 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 we need to witness more. You're missing something, though. There is no such thing as just witnessing. There's no such thing as being active in your faith by just sharing a scripture with someone. That is not what activity in faith is. Jesus Christ did not say, go drop a little scripture bomb on somebody. Go give them an encouragement. He didn't say that. He said, make disciples. Why would you settle for something less than what Jesus Christ said to do? Well, I just, you know, I really like to witness to people. I like to evangelize. It's not evangelism if you're not making disciples. Now, you have to evangelize to be able to make disciples. I'm not criticizing anyone's effort. I'm saying that you're, you're playing on an eight-foot goal and thinking you're tall. Okay? The goal is discipleship. The goal is not, well, brother, I'm just there to plant a seed. Show me that in the Bible. Say, so, well, I, 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 so I plant, somebody else waters it. The man that, that said that, well, actually, let's just look at 1 Corinthians 4.17. You forgive me, I may be unnecessarily offensive. It's not like I'm working from notes here. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my, whom I, who is in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Paul did say that one plants, one waters, one gets the increase. He said this about he and Apollos, who were both disciple makers. The goal is always discipleship. You cannot be satisfied just to plant a seed. This is what we do when we're immature and we want to feel like we won, but we didn't win. You might as well go become a YouTube gamer or something. Okay? 
our goal in evangelism can only be one thing, to make disciples. And it's not somebody's job to plant a seed and somebody else's job to make disciples. It is every person in this room's job to make disciples. Now let's get to the bottom line, though. You can't do that if you have not been discipled because you just don't know what to do. And that's why you settle for lesser objectives. Man, you change, you, you see Jesus change one person's life that you now feel like you would rather die than see them die. See, you don't feel that way when you just drop a track on somebody at Burger King. When you would rather die than see them die. Now the kingdom is manifesting in our midst. So... Let me back up just a little bit. I am not trying to demean evangelistic efforts. If you want to trap somebody in the elevator here, praise God. I, I'm all for it. I'm really not trying to. I, I bet I've handed out 100,000 tracks in my life. Uh, I think I've seen zero fruit from it, but I, I've done it a lot. I believe in an actual collision course with people that leaves them no choice except Baal or Yahweh. And when they leave the meeting, they know where they stand. And you are following up. You are working to establish a relationship that causes them to see your way of life, which agrees with what you teach, what happens at your home, and what happens on the street, and what happens in the pulpit, so that they want to imitate that. That's what they want. And they turn their back on Baal and run for the God of Israel. See, now if that's what you're calling evangelism, then praise God. That's not what most people are calling evangelism, though. I care nothing for decision cards. I care nothing for how many gospel presentations you made today. Those things make people feel better about not having made disciples. Do you remember? You asked to see our discipleship program. I will show you our disciples. Not, not our red light, green light, yellow light, ridiculous carnality. Yeah, I'm glad you have no idea what that is. Now, I say all of that to say, the goal here, it's, it's not to belittle an evangelism effort. You gotta start somewhere, praise God. If you have a hard time talking to people, use a track. If, if that's, you know, but it, it's not the end. It, it's a beginning. If you have a hard time making disciples, then start with conversations. That's okay. It, but it's not the end. It's, it's a beginning. The goal this year is that you care <clears throat> so little for the things of this world. I just say it like I mean it. You don't care a damn for the things of this world. When they're dead to you and you to them. So you've lost all fear about talking to people about Jesus. You've lost all fear of consequence. You've lost all fear of loss. Then you can become a DCD that is a disciple that creates disciples. See, that's what we're looking for. And that's what you're called to or you wouldn't be sitting here. Now, some of you are dating us. I get that. You're not sure what to think. You still want to go to a respectable church. One that you can take your family to and they'll say, oh, wasn't that sweet? We're not sweet. Most people will not find us respectable. But that's not the question. The question is, does God respect what we're doing? Was it born of him? Okay. Now, those of you that are dating us, I know that we're rough. There are pretty pastors here. You saw Pastor Hutchinson. Do you notice that we're not all cut out of the same cookie cutter mold, though? We're not. I mean, if I was as handsome as Zeke, I wouldn't have a beard, but I'm not. We don't all look alike. We don't all act alike. We're just all disciple makers. 
we're all one standard. We all hold the same bar just as high, and we, we're excited to do it with each other. It's easy to caricaturize us to try to dismiss the message. That's why I opened the way that I did the other night. If you're here and you're dating us, I'd like you to consider something. Looking around us, right here, you could be in a church of a few thousand and you won't find this many serious people about Jesus. You could be in, you could be in a lot of churches with many thousands and not find ten men who can do what the pastor does. Pastor Treister said that some of the, the men were running behind me, following, breathing down my neck. I, listen, he's half right. The truth is, is many are far ahead. Men that started behind are now ahead. That's the goal. Look, I, I would like to embarrass the guys the same way that I feel embarrassed. That kind of levels things, but I'm not going to do it. Instead, instead, I'm just going to, I'm going to say this. They're advancing the gospel in places that I never would have thought of. They're touching lives I never would have thought of. They're showing tenacity and getting miracles that I've never seen. Okay? They're, Eric is far short of the goal. The goal is Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. He wants us to hit the goal. What discipleship is not is some kind of pyramid scheme. It's not a Ponzi thing. F forgive me, but it's not Amway. Or Prime America, or whatever it is that is being peddled these days in church circles. The goal is that those that have started behind you because of your efforts go beyond you. That is the goal. And there is no other. If you're dating us here, the question is, are you currently in a place where you are certain that your pastor, that the group that you're a part of, wants to lay down his life to see you outshine him. And if he doesn't, then how much like Jesus can he really be? Because that is what we're cultivating here. We're not perfect at it. We're still learning. There's a lot we're trying to still figure out. But I got to tell you, you're seeing group after group lead worship. And so what you don't know is two years ago, half of those people couldn't do that. You're seeing prophecy after prophecy that is right and in order. And what you don't know is 18 months ago, most of those people couldn't do that. Okay. A few decades of hard work. And we will have hundreds of churches that did not decline, decline in quality they increased in quality. Tonight, you're going to hear from Pastor Vincent. We are going to dismiss for dinner. We're giving you extra time. We're going to start that service at 730, which means you have two and a half hours to go get some food. We pray you don't get so much food that you don't come back hungry because we're seeing extraordinary things in the heart of the largest Islamic nation in the world. What we have ahead of us is as good as what you've already heard. And what we're going to do in the years to come is going to outshine everything that we've done here. It may be inartful what I'm saying, and that's okay. I, I'm not a trained speaker. I barely graduated high school, and my own father had to throw me out on several occasions because he was my principal. I want you to catch our beating heart. We're not interested in conformity with what everybody else is doing. So you're going to see if you live long enough in the kingdom that everybody gets excited about a trend and then it goes away and everybody gets excited about another trend and it goes away. That is not who we are. 
We will never be that way. We are interested in the old wine. It doesn't change. It just keeps fermenting. We recognize that if we said things differently, if we acted a little differently, if we could just tone some things down, that we could build much bigger churches. But I don't care a damn for building bigger churches. I want exactly as many people as want to be discipled because that's what we're called to make. We are not called to seat as many as we can. Jesus had 6,000 in one occasion. They ate with him. They agreed with him. They followed him around for all of the wrong reasons. So he began saying things that he knew they would find unacceptable, but it didn't make them any less right just to weed them out. And then he turns to those closest to him and says, do you want to leave too? See, the gospel is not about accumulating large crowds. It's about making disciples that can make dis disciples. We're going to ask the Lord to cure our sterile nature. If you've been in the kingdom five years, 10 years, 15 years, 50 years, and you haven't discipled anyone, then you're living less than Christ intended you to. And you can hang on to pride. You can do that. You can say, well, I, it's, it's, I just do it differently. My way is this. And, and you can do that. And you'll be just as unfruitful as you've already been. Or you can humble yourself. You can say, man, whatever this thing is, I can feel the truthfulness of it. And I want to be like a child, prideless, able to take direction. I want to learn what it is because whatever time I have left, whatever that is, I'm going to bear the fruit that God's called me to bear. In other words, you can defend your reputation or you cannot care a damn for it. You're beginning to get why we're devotees to death. A lot has to die to make disciples. Just like your children, you will see in your disciples everything that you ever did wrong. And you'll see what God did through you that was amazing. We're all supposed to experience this, and we want you to experience it. We are a family of churches. We are an association. We are church planters. We are a lot of things. But the basis for everything that we do is discipleship. Because without it, the kingdom does not work at all. Now, Eric said one small thing wrong, only one thing. He said, I do not look at these men as disciples. I look at them as sons. Finish reading the Talmudim and you'll find out there's no difference. We've just bastardized the word disciple. We've made it something that it is not in its original text. A disciple is not a student. A disciple is not a mere follower. A disciple is not an adherent. A disciple quite simply is one who becomes exactly what their rabbi is and more. See, apprenticeship would be more uh, fitting in our language. And anybody who's going to an apprentice to be an electrician, and they study, and they study, and they go to class after class, and after 15 years, they have not yet achieved being an electrician, wouldn't you say that something's wrong with their apprenticeship program? Okay, hey, let's pray. Stand to your feet. <laughs> Is anybody hungry for what the first century saw? then we're going to have to return to the methods that they used. Can we close in prayer? Prayer for a restoration of biblical discipleship in the life of every person here. Nobody's beyond it. I'm not beyond it. The pastors aren't beyond it. You are certainly not beyond it. We want a restoration of biblical discipleship which means you're going to have to figure out what it is in the Word. 
You always have to leave something. You always have to go after something. You always have to sacrifice. There's no other kind of discipleship. That call is the same today as it was then. Let's pray for it. Let's pray for a revelation. Let's pray that the Lord show us what it looks like. That we don't waste any more time. Father, we're asking here and now. We're asking for a revelation on this group. A revelation to be granted to us, awarded to us. Lord, and something to be unveiled to us. What it looks like to truly be a Talmudim. That it's not something that young men do. It's not something that old men do. It's something that all men must continue to do. Holy One, will you help us? Will you open our eyes and circumcise the pride away from our hearts that keeps us from having what you want us to have? Spirit of holiness, would you move upon these people that you have called? Lord, would you draw them? The precious blood of Jesus Christ has purchased you. Now may he work into you what is pleasing to him. That you produce the fruit of the kingdom. With all God's people in one time, at one time, we're not just going to say amen which has become like abracadabra. It means so be it. It doesn't just mean that you agree with with what is said. It means that you're going to help make it happen. Instead of saying amen, can we say Talmudim? Father, in the name of Jesus, help us make Amen. Amen.